remind or remain standing just for a moment, I want to read a passage of scripture. Our brother read earlier from Ephesians, the sixth chapter, the closing of Paul's epistle. I want us to look at the first chapter of Ephesians. So we find that this is a writing of the apostle Paul and he's writing to the saints at Ephesus and to the faithful in Christ Jesus. And he says in verse three, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, or in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, through which he has made us accepted in the beloved, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we will pause before thy throne of grace and ask that your blessed spirit would be poured out upon us in this place. We ask for liberty to worship you. Ask that you would uh, open your word to our hearts and to our understanding and that truly we might be given the eyes of faith to behold the beauty and the grace and the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray, amen. You may be seated. I'd like for us this morning to pay special attention to verse seven, where we find that we have certain blessings in our Lord Jesus Christ, namely redemption and the forgiveness of sin. When we read the passage, we just read these verses, uh, verses three through six are telling us things that God the Father has done for us on our behalf that we might be accepted in his son Christ. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. And where are those blessings? They're in the heavenlies in Christ Jesus. He has blessed us according as he hath chosen us. We find that he has predestinated us unto the adoption of sons and you'll find that each one of these verbs is in the aorist tense. It may not mean a lot to you, but there is a point for that. Aorist is the tense of punctiliar action. That means it was done one time, completed action, and that's what he's establishing. God has blessed us with all spiritual blessings. God has chosen us. God has predestined us and all, verse six says, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, in verse seven, he starts a little different theme here. He's not talking so much about the work of the father as he's talking about the work of the son. And he is called in verse six, the beloved the beloved of God, in whom, two little words there, the blessings that we're going to consider today, this redemption and the forgiveness of sin are only to be found in Christ. It's in him, in the beloved, in whom we have redemption. The we in verse seven is the same as the us in verse four, the chosen people of God. He has chosen us 
And we, the ones whom he has chosen in Christ, have, and he names two blessings here, redemption and forgiveness of sin. Now these are not, of course, the only blessings that we have in Christ, but these are fundamental. These are a foundation upon which other blessings are founded. You know, when Christ was asked, what's the greatest law? Christ's answer was twofold. He said, do you have a love to God with all of your heart, mind, and strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself? Upon these two hinge all the rest of the law. Well, I think here we have something similar that upon these two blessings rest all the other blessings. There's so much included in this word redemption and in the idea of the forgiveness of sin. Now these are not synonyms. He's not telling us that redemption and the forgiveness of sin are exactly the same. But they are very much like faith and repentance. They can't be separated. So we find that in whom we have redemption and the forgiveness of sins, both of these come to us through his blood. You see how we are continually focused back upon the person of Christ. It's in him that we are blessed and the blessings are purchased through his blood. That's what we would call the instrumental cause of these blessings is the shed blood of Christ. And then all of this, he tells us, in the last phrase, is according to the riches of his grace. This is the effectual cause. This is the, the basis. This is the motivation behind all of this is the grace of God. That's how he ended uh, the first few verses here talking about God's work, he says it's to the praise of the glory of his grace. Amazing grace. When it tells us here that uh, this is the work that Christ is doing for us, uh, he tells us that this also in verse 12, that this should be to the praise of of his glory. And then it speaks in the next couple of verses of the working of the Spirit. And again it says, unto the praise of his glory. His glory is his grace. Grace is an amazing thing. And I think you can tell from this expanded translation that I just gave you the direction I wanted to go with this. We want to look at the blessings, redemption, and the forgiveness of sin, the instrumental cause of these blessings being the blood of Christ, his death, and then the effectual cause of these blessings being the grace of God. If we look and think about these blessings, they are twofold. He mentions two of them. There is redemption and there is the forgiveness of sin. And one commentator, well, it was more than one actually, used the phrase that these two are in what they call apposition. Not opposition, you know, the letter O, opposition, means that there is some opposing going on. That's not what it is. It's apposition. It means that they are in harmony, they are in parallel to one another. And usually, when you have two words or phrases that are in apposition, they have the same deferment, and that is, as we find here, both redemption and the forgiveness of sin are through the blood of Christ. Now, when we think about this and think about the Lord's teaching, you can turn back to Gospel of Matthew for a minute. Two different passages, very close together. You can find Matthew Turn to chapter 20. In 
In Matthew chapter 20 and in verse 28. He tells us, even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and notice this, and to give his life a ransom for many. That's a redemption. The word in our text in Ephesians is, could be rightly understood as including the meaning of ransom. He gave his life a ransom for many, not for all, but for many. And then if you'll turn to Matthew chapter 26. And again, verse 28. <clears throat> Even as we just observed the Lord's Supper, this is Matthew's account of it, that he took the cup, he gave thanks and gave it to them, drink ye all of it. He says, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many, why? For the remission of sins. What is that? The forgiveness of sins. We find that Christ said these are two reasons that he came upon the earth, two reasons why he was incarnate, he condescended to come, and that is that he might, one, ransom many, his people, and that he might bring to pass the remission of sin, the forgiveness of sin for those same many. You see, if we look at these two blessings, it approaches our atonement from two different perspectives. You know, the, they say that uh, the eye of the beholder uh, kind of determines what you see. If you're standing in front of an elephant, what you see is different than what you would see if you were standing behind the elephant. Well, here we find that the redemption, this views it from the perspective of God and what he has done. The redemption is payment made to the offended party. Who is it that is offended by our sin but Almighty God? This pastor has been teaching it is a form of deicide, sin, that we want to remove God, have God removed from his throne that we might be like unto God even as Satan tempted Eve in the garden by saying, ye shall be like God, determining for yourself what is good and what is evil. That pretty much describes our society today, doesn't it? It's been left to man. They have pushed God aside, thrown out the word of God, want nothing to do with God, and they have determine for themselves. They say, this is good and this is evil. Whereas God says, what you call good is actually evil. And what is actually good or evil, you now call good. We've got things reversed. But we find that this is a redemption. It's payment that is made to the offended party. It is an expiation or a propitiation in 1 John chapter 2, we find there that John is uh, telling us that if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ. And that he is a propitiation for our sins, not ours only, but the sins of the world. And that word propitiation could be expiation. We have, we have a God who has been offended, and not just lightly offended. We have a God who has been offended and affronted most viciously by the human race, the people that he had created for himself, a people that he had created for the purpose 
of his glory. That's why we were put upon the earth, as we were to glorify God. And instead of glorifying him, we have rebelled against him. And there needs to be a reconciliation. When you think of forgiveness, this is viewing it from man's perspective. We need forgiveness. We need to be set free from a debt we owe. A debt to the holiness of God. And guess what? We have nothing with which to pay it. No matter how long you try to save up and put good works in the bank, it will not be sufficient to reconcile you to your God. So we have the forgiveness of sin. And this forgiveness, the psalmist tells us in Psalm 103, verse 12, that God has taken our sins and removed them as far as the east is from the west. You know how far that is? If he had said as far as the north is from the south, that wouldn't have been so good. Because you can only go north so far, North Pole, and then you guess what? You start heading south again. But if you start going east and come around, you're still going to be going east. If you go west and go all the way around, you're still going west. The two never meet. The sins are done away with. They have been removed. And God will remember them against us no more. So what is this redemption? Mr. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown had this definition. They said redemption includes not only deliverance from sin's penalty, but from its pollution and enslaving power negatively. And it includes the reconciliation of an offended God and satisfaction unto a just God positively. Two views of this thing in a negative sense. We've been delivered, delivered from sin. That's what redemption is. It's a deliverance to be set free. We have been set free from sin in its penalty, its power, and ultimately will be saved from its presence. But on the positive side, not just freed from something, but free to something, we have now been delivered to a state of reconciliation. God is no longer angry with us if we are in Christ. We've been reconciled. God no longer looks upon us as being under his wrath because a sacrifice has been made to satisfy the wrath of God. The evidence of that satisfaction is the fact that God raised Christ up from the grave. So his resurrection is something that we can rejoice in as well. But he gives us a deliverance, a deliverance from the power of our adversary, the devil. This is what Pastor again has been teaching on uh, in, in the uh, previous messages. And he has told us how that Christ came to destroy the works of the devil. You recall again back in the book of Matthew in chapter 6, when the disciples came to Christ and asked him, they said, Lord, teach us to pray. Teach us how to pray. And he gave them the model prayer, some called the Lord's Prayer. And in that, he uses the phrase, deliver us from evil, the King James says. But actually in the original language, it's saying, deliver us from the evil one. That is from Satan. We have been redeemed. A ransom wasn't paid. You know, I've heard this. Maybe you have too. When Christ paid the ransom for our sins, he didn't make payment to Satan. I mean, that, that is just completely false. That's, you know, not even worthy of consideration. That didn't happen. When Christ paid the ransom for our deliverance, he paid it unto the Father. 
But in that payment, he has delivered us from our adversary, the devil. The one who would seek to condemn, the one who would accuse, the one who does all within his power to hinder the people of God. We've been delivered from that. find that when accusation is brought against us, we would have to imitate our Lord when he was accused before Pilate. We were reading that. When he stood before Pilate and said in the John 19 where we were just reading, Christ opened not his mouth. He didn't say a word. You know why? He knew why he was there. He was taking the place of sinners. And so when Pilate and the others would lay charge to him of a certain sin, he did not refute that. He said, that's been laid on my account. When, when our conscience would condemn us, we have Christ who intercedes for us. And he speaks to us through his blood. That sin has been redeemed and paid for. We have deliverance from the power of our adversary, the devil. We have deliverance from sin and its power. Paul says that it no longer, no longer lets sin reign in your mortal bodies. It does not reign over us. We no longer are enslaved to sin. It's not to be the thing that controls uh, our life. Turn over to the book of Titus. It's just a few pages over. If you get as far as Hebrews, you've gone too far. But in Titus chapter 2, Paul here is speaking of, we just had a conference on the blessed hope. Verse 13 of Titus, he says, looking for that blessed hope, the glorious appearing of the great God, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity, all of it, past, present, future. You say, how could he redeem me from something I haven't even done yet? Guess what? When Christ died upon the cross, you weren't even born yet. You hadn't done anything. So all of your sin was future at that time. So he has redeemed us from all iniquity and purifies unto himself a people, a peculiar people, a people of his own, zealous of good works. He's redeemed us from iniquity. We have the deliverance from the fear of death. That's a very real phobia, a fear of death. People fear the unknown. No one's been able to come back. I know Lazarus did, but I don't think he talked a whole lot about his death. We don't know what's to be expected on the other side. We don't know what we are to expect when we, comes our time to die. And we read these stories of all the martyrs of the gruesome agonizing deaths they undergo and we think I don't think I could do that well you know what in yourself you can but at the same time you've not been putting that position yet either sufficient unto the day is his glory is his strength whatever he set upon you to do that day he'll give you the grace and the strength to, to do it and that's what he means when he says, I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. So we find that we are delivered from the fear of death. That is both corporal or physical death. We no longer have to fear that. As he says in 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is thy sting? Where is thy victory? Has no victory over us. In Christ, he has made death but a doorway into a better place. 
But not only does he remove the fear of physical death, but he removes the fear, the concern, the anxiety of what's called the second death. Over in Revelation 20 and verse 6, it talks about the second death. If we are in Christ, we have been redeemed, and we do not need to fear a partaking in that death. We have not only redemption, but the forgiveness of sins. Those sins from which we have been delivered are forgiven. We find that the primary meaning of the word translated forgiveness is propitiation. That is offering to God a perfect and sufficient sacrifice. Had to be both. Had to be perfect. Could be no spot, no blemish. When the people were instructed at the time of the Exodus, they were told to take a lamb and to close it up and to observe it for a number of days to make sure that that animal was without spot and blemish. Because it had to be a perfect sacrifice. also has to be a sufficient sacrifice. Sufficient to atone for, to meet the requirements of a holy God. As pastors told us on numerous occasions, how good does a person have to be to go to heaven? You have to be as good as God. We have to have both a perfect and a sufficient sacrifice. Would you turn back just a moment to the book of Romans? Romans chapter 3, that's a passage I think we're all, <coughs> excuse me, familiar with. <clears throat> or in Romans 3 and verse 23, he says, For all have sinned. We've sinned against God. You know, there's so much is made about the argument over original sin. We don't have to worry about that so much. We have enough personal sin to condemn us that we don't have to worry about original. But all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation through faith in his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are past through the forbearance of God to declare I say at this time his righteousness that he might be just and justifier of him who believes in Jesus do you see how often those two blessings are associated you read of redemption and you read of remission of sins or forgiveness they're always joined together. We have redemption that is in Christ who set forth to be a propitiation. Why? It's for, it's to declare the righteousness of God in the remission of sin. You see, God does not arbitrarily forgive sin. He doesn't look at us and say, you know, I know you didn't really mean to do that. That was just a, you know, mistake. And, and I'm going to forgive you of that. No. No. You know why God can forgive us? Hebrews tells us that we ought to forgive one another even as God, for Christ's sake, forgives us. It's for the sake of Christ. It's because of the shed blood of our Lord and Savior that he can forgive us. And this is through his being a propitiation, through the shedding of his blood, he declares that God is both just and and the justifier. In Christ, we have a perfect sacrifice and a sufficient sacrifice so that God can forgive us and his glory and his grace should not be diminished one iota. We find that forgiveness can be viewed and defined in several aspects. We think of forgiveness in personal terms. 
It is the cessation of the anger of moral resentment of God against sin. Colossians chapter 1, verse 20. We find that in ethical terms, it is a release from the guilt of sin which oppresses the conscience. Hebrews 10, 22. And in legal terms, it is the remission of the punishment of sin, which is eternal death. That's why Paul says in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1, there is therefore now no condemnation. Forgiveness on personal terms, God's no longer angry with us. We're accepted in Christ. He looks upon us, if you can handle this, he looks upon his saints as the apple of his eye because they are the body of Christ. Dr. Foster tells us oftentimes you can't say enough about the church because it's the body of Christ. And so we have a reconciliation. Paul even said that he was a minister of reconciliation. We've been reconciled to God so that the anger of God has been removed against us. The resentment of God against sin has been taken care of and satisfied. In ethical terms, we have been released from the guilt of sin so that our own conscience cannot successfully smite us and condemn us before God. Have you thought about that? We stand guiltless before a holy God. One who is so holy that even the angels are considered unclean in his sight. And the ones that have wings with two cover their face because of the shame, because of their uncleanness in the sight of God. But God has removed that guilt. And legally, God is both just and justifier of those who come to him. And a just God will not demand double payment for sin. No matter what the accuser may accuse us of, if it's true accusations, we'll not have to suffer for it because one has already made payment for us. So how is this secured for us? What's the instrumental cause of this? It is through the blood of Christ. We find that it is a costly redemption. When we observe the Lord's Supper today, we did eat the bread that represented his body, how that it was crushed us. We did drink of the cup, which was his blood that was shed for us in the issuing of a new covenant. And we find that the cost of our redemption was nothing short of the blood of God. You read over in the book of Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. Could you turn there for a minute? I know you know this verse. I'm not sharing new things with you, but it's something that I, like Peter, I put your remembrance of. Acts chapter 20. He tells us in verse 28, I can find it, I'm sure. Here Paul is saying, in the defense of the faith, he said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock. This is, he's talking now to the elders of the church at Ephesus, to whom we're studying the letter here. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood.
What price can you put on the redemption of a child of God? How valuable are you to God? He gave his only begotten son. It was the blood of God that purchased us. That is, that is the instrument that is used to bring us this redemption and this forgiveness of sin, the, the blood of Christ. And the motivation behind it, the effectual call, cause of all of this is the glory and the grace of God to reveal his grace according to the riches of his grace. Do you remember reading a passage that where sin did abound, grace did much more abound? It's the riches of his grace. There is a group, it's called Sila, sings hymns and different you know, courses and songs. And they have a song that they sing. It's um, the depth of mercy. And one of the phrases says, can it be that there remains mercy and grace for me. Having shown grace and mercy to so many, we can't count the number that will be in heaven. It's a numberless, but to think that the grace of God is so abounding that there's even grace for a sinner like me. We can stand before God in our Lord Jesus Christ. Why? Because he hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we would again approach unto thy throne of grace. For we confess that it is sovereign grace, it's amazing grace. It is truly the grace of God to which we owe everything. All that we are, we owe to the grace of our Lord God, Jesus Christ. We thank you so much for our Lord who has shed his own blood that we might have redemption, that we might be delivered that we might be set free. And in that freedom, we might enjoy the privilege and the blessing of the forgiveness of sin. May we go forth, even this day, rejoicing in our Lord, singing praises unto him who alone is worthy. And we thank you for these blessings now in Christ and in for his sake we pray. Amen.